Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Omni Athlete. You're here because like us, you believe that sport is a vehicle for elevating global consciousness. But you know that elevating global consciousness through sport only matters if it actually helps you to achieve a peak performance state, get in the zone, and compete at your highest level. We created this show to highlight the world's highest achieving mind, body, and spirit competitors to unveil for you the side of sports that most never see and rarely know exists. So today's guest is on a mission to untaint laughter, invite us all to get back to the mystery and love of being seven years old and redefine the word no to mean I know you've got something better through authentic communication and the use of game dynamics. He's a classically trained actor comedian and the president and founder of the nationally acclaimed communication firm Game On Nation where he has revolutionized the way athletes, coaches, and executives train through his groundbreaking mile curriculum. He has deployed this innovative approach to communication and learning with some of the most demanding clients imaginable, including 10 number one overall draft picks, 50 plus first round NBA, NFL, and NHL draft picks, high profile corporations, and military organizations. As an actor, he was featured in such ridiculously beloved movies like American Pie 2 and one of our personal favorites, Space Jam, as well as hit shows like Will and Grace, Dharma and Greg, and Married with Children, just to name a few. What strikes you the most, though, as you enter his world is not how much he's accomplished the ESPN specials he's in or the 100,000 plus views his TEDx talk has racked up. It's the ability he has to invite laughter and vulnerability into some of the rooms in sports that need it the most with games like Expert Speaker, Red Light, Green Light, and By the Numbers. It's my pleasure to introduce to Omni Athlete, the man who uses improvisation to teach communication, Steve Schembaum. Welcome to the show, Steve. I'm not joking, Josh. I have goosebumps off of that intro, dude. You <laughs> are amazing. I, I wrote down ridiculously beloved. That's <laughs> kind of perfect. It's like an oxymoron. That is really I, cool, man, that you were so intentional and honored uh, my story. It means a lot to me. Oh, absolutely. I, uh, you know, the goal with, with the intro uh, is to really make sure that I can do as good a job as possible telling your story so that we can just dive in, yeah. right? You know, and, yeah. and make sure that, you know, you're here to, to share perspective, not just regurgitate a, a biography, right? No, I really appreciate that. And when we talked about, yeah, I don't really want to share the history of my company. That's not something mm-hmm. that I think your listeners are going to be interested in as much mm-hmm. as let's just try to all together share some best practices. I don't think uh, I'm a guru. I, I, the reason I wanted to join you is because your style is also very authentic, I think, and very sincere. So I think most of the listeners out there are pretty accomplished themselves. Let's assume we're all ridiculously beloved. Yeah. And then we can just sort of like throw out some ideas yeah. that might validate what they're already doing well. And But I just, yeah, the approach of not being a guru, I think, mm-hmm. is, is way more appealing than to come in and be like, listen, man, I figured it all out. I figured it all out, and I'm just so humbled and blessed to be able to bless you all. That just doesn't work for me. No, and it's not real, right? I, I think no. there's a, you know, I, I think we, we've had guests on in the past and I think you'll echo this idea, right? We're all learning, right? Constantly. Totally. And, yeah. and there's this natural understanding as we grow that the more we can put ourselves in positions to learn, the more valuable we become to the people around us, right? And helping them grow too. So I think it's supernatural. And uh, I think, there, there's so many places, Steve, that I wanted, wanted to start. I okay. think the, the topic that I'll kick us off with is trust. Okay. And, and I'd love to just kind of start open-ended and then I'll, I'll kind of guide us if we need to. But sure. let's start just with that notion in terms of communication and especially around locker rooms and that coach-player dynamic. Yeah, I think there's a, two things going on with trust. I think as a presenter, let's assume that a lot of the folks that are listening are coaches or teachers. Let's just assume we're all presenters sure. at some point. Yeah. Even if you're not in the sports world, you're presenting – to your spouse or your significant other. I think you have to first earn the trust uh, of a team. And I I think it's hard. That's why I think it's really difficult to get some, and I've been this guy where you just come in as a sparkle speaker and you do your 60 minute session and there's no sort of understanding of the culture of the team and and you're an outside presenter coming in. I think it's way more valuable. I think teams could benefit so much more if they thought about bringing in presenters that have earned the right to speak into these folks. Maybe they've earned the right because they've written an amazing book and all the players have read that book or they're affiliated with the organization. 
But I think the big part is to build trust is you have to earn the right to speak into people. Mm -hmm. um, that's one that I've noticed. And then once you're in the presentation, I think that first seven minutes, it's really important to like, like let these folks know, are you there for the right reasons? Are you there to get more Twitter followers? Or are you there to improve their culture? And so that's the battle that I, so once you've earned the right to be in the room, it's like that first seven minutes uh, is really tricky. So I try to approach it by uh, utilizing humor yeah. uh, because that's a, to be a common denominator. And once you can show them that you're there for the right reasons and, and, and you're not just trying to you know, sell more books, not that that's not a bad you know, uh, sort of result, but that's it. So trust is key. And, and I love that we're starting with that. It's a tricky one. And, you have to be confident, yeah. and at the same time, you have to be uh, able to acknowledge that you're flawed. Yeah. So maybe that's where we could go with that. Like, how do you stay confident in this room? Because it's, it's big time, man. You're, yeah. You don't want to show yeah. up and be like, hey, first of all, I, I don't belong here. You don't, <laughs> right. start, you don't want to start a, pre a live presentation in that regard. Yeah. But how do you define that you do belong in the room, and at the same time, you let the, these, these people know that, that you're flawed as well? So I, I watched in a... a uh, a talk that you gave with a room of NBA coaches, right, a couple years ago, and with and and had Jason Kidd up and had him going through some of the games that, that you play, and I, mm. I was so a couple things come to mind within that that vein of trust. So as an athlete, right, I, I think about Jason Kidd and I think about somebody who was at the literally the pinnacle of, of the sport, maybe one of the, the top five point guards of all time, right, considered to be, and and he went into coaching really soon after that, right. And you've got this this dynamic where. He doesn't need to prove to any locker room he goes into that he knows basketball, but he still has to find a way to communicate in a way that, that matches the room, right? And yeah. I find that to be super interesting and probably challenging to let that wall down. It's so interesting you point that out, Josh, and I appreciate that you watched that. Yeah. Uh, there was a really special moment that I don't know was captured on video where Jason, again, Hall of Famer, one of the greatest point guards ever, talk about vision. Yeah. And we were playing a game called Red Light, Green Light, which is a very challenging game. And at one point he was struggling and I had to do two things to uh, develop trust. Mm -hmm. One is I had to keep reinforcing, Jason, I've got your back. Mm -hmm. I've got your back, but you can't just say I've got your back. You've got to then show them. So I got, got like off the chair and I was really involved knowing, man, you're, you're, it would be like him teaching me how to bring the ball up the court. Like it's not my realm. Yeah. So I have him now in my realm. And the other thing is I kept reinforcing the idea of laugh with, not at. So yeah. to go back to this trust idea, you've got to define when you're using humor, there's rules to humor. There's rules to the game. So laugh with, not at, and I've got your back. But, but the best moment was when Jason was struggling at first, understandably. It's a really yeah. challenging game. And then he stopped, and he had the beautiful moment where he said, whew, man, if someone could just give me a basketball. <laughs> yeah, I remember. And that was yeah. so great. He's like, something like that. And that, to me, was a really wonderful, authentic moment. It was like, wow, man, this man is being so vulnerable and saying, like, he'd rather be bringing a ball to court than doing this weird improv game. And then it was a great teachable moment to say, let's work together to try to increase that familiarity. So, yeah. 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 And no, and, and, and what, what comes to mind there too, right, is, is this, this idea, when we try to create those connections, there is such yeah. a natural tendency to not want to, to admit that I want the ball in my hand, right? There is right. This, this tendency to say, you know, I need to either be this big, you know, strong, I need to not, not, appear as if I care at all about what the person across me thinks. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's so easy, Steve, to take this from the side of the coach, but I also think as athletes, right, there is this natural tendency to want to appear a certain way when we communicate and not to necessarily, um, to feel that trust coming back, right. To, to feel that ability to say, Hey, I'm going to talk to you when I don't have the ball in my hand, I'm going to talk to you with this real level of what I'm feeling. And I, yeah, it's just such an, an interesting and challenging dynamic. And I think that it, you have to create parameters. So I think the challenge is athletes, let's use this framework of athletes. It doesn't matter what sport, there is a, a need to be confident. There's a need to be an, an intense. There's a need to be tough. There's a need to be grounded. There's a lot of value in those terms. And I think as, as a presenter who does something slightly untraditional, I also have to create parameters and say, as I bring laughter into the room or improvisation, I am not in any way trying to strip you of your strength. Um, I'm not trying to, there's a, the vulnerability is a tricky word. So when we teach, we better define what we mean mm -hmm. by vulnerability. Vulnerability does not be, mean be soft. Right. Vulnerability does not mean be weak. 
Jason Kidd said, man, I, I'd love basketball in my hand right now. That wasn't weak. To me, that was strength. So you have to be a, a, a strong enough teacher and have done it enough yeah. to where when he says, man, I wish I had a ball in my hand, that you immediately drive that moment into a powerful moment versus a mocking moment, a shameful moment. And that's where it just gets tricky. And this is where, if we want to keep going down this trust lane, that's great. The, the idea of teaching, listen, Josh, what you and you guys, what you and your team do is slightly untraditional. I hope it becomes traditional. I hope what I do becomes more traditional. I don't right. want to be a niche. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be this weird sort of wild. So I want this to be part of the norm, but we, we better all um, make each other accountable and know that interactivity and untraditional teaching uh, can be extremely dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. Mm. So going back to this trust thing that yeah. if we want to keep on this lens is yeah. when you, when you let's use improv as one vehicle, when you use improvisation as a vehicle to, to teach, boy, it's not as simple as watching a video or Googling improv games. If you're doing that, that's like a, a strength coach Googling how to do a squat yeah. and then immediately teaching you and I how to do a squat and that's just dangerous because that could jack up our back. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so there's, if we talk about defining language, right, defining the rules, defining the parameters, there is, it's really clear when, when I watch any of the games that you or your team utilize, right? Any of the techniques, the, the talks that you give, you do a great job of defining language. And I think we have this tendency um, and forget whether it's coach or athlete, let's just say, as you, as you said, presenting, right? We have this tendency to assume that the language we use is going to be heard and understood from the same perspective, yes. right? And, yeah. and, and it's not defined. That seems so critical. Yeah, that's huge. And let's, maybe we can authentically drive right into that the yeah. idea of language. Well, let's acknowledge something for those who are listening and those who are viewing. We're talking right now as two fairly privileged white guys. Okay, so I'll acknowledge this right now. I go into rooms where I am one of the only privileged white guys in the room. I have to be sensitive and, 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 and empathetic enough to understand that I don't know everything in that room. And I'm not the most knowledgeable to some degree. And language is so important to define and understand what it means to me versus what it means to the young men and women that I'm teaching. So that takes some time, um, but it also takes discernment and wisdom. I'll give you an example. When you say a term to any audience, forget now uh, an audience that you don't, uh, that, that isn't the same culture, let's just say different age, okay? So, which is a huge issue. I'm 47. I'm getting older. My audiences stay similar age if I'm dealing with the sports world. Right. If you're in the sports world and you're in college and pro sports, you're dealing with between 18 and let's say, I'll put Tom Brady in the mix. So 39, right? For, yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. But very rare you having an elite athlete in their 40s. And that's, that's, that's a testament to how difficult it is to be an elite athlete. But so, so that audience is staying the same. When you say terms like relentless let's use that one be relentless yeah. I, there's nothing wrong with the term relentless without wisdom there's tremendous danger in the word relentless rise and grind rise and grind win the now so let's just use win the now rise and grind be relentless yeah. if those terms aren't clarified man you can jack up someone's back because win the now let me with no wisdom behind win the now you know who wins that fire energy because you're going to be tired you won the now. What do I do now? And actually, those terms don't always transfer to a younger audience or an audience where you, you that's very, to me, you've got to, you've got to really do research on where these posters are coming from. And some of these posters are like, you know, maybe need to be left in the, in the 80s. There's, you know, we talk a lot, Steve, about being able to, so mind, body, spirit is kind of the backdrop of, of our lens through, through athletic performance. And we talk a lot about having that connection between the mind and the body to understand what our body's telling us. And so if the mantras that were, that are in our head, right. if the phrases we're using are rise and grind, relentless, right? And, and we don't have the wisdom to understand sometimes the most the wisest thing to do is to pull back for a day, right? Right. Yeah. Sometimes there, there is a, there's tremendous value and, and scientifically backed research and showing how powerful it can be for my body. If I rest, if I recover, if I train in a different manner, but it, like you said, if I have those phrases in my head without wisdom, I'm going to keep going. and I'm going to ignore maybe the wisdom that my body's giving me. And a hundred percent judge. And I just don't see in the college and pro space, a lot of posters that say, get eight, get eight, get eight hours of sleep. That's not a popular poster. And I get why, man, I'm a, I'm a competitive guy. I'm not in the seventh place trophies. Yeah. I don't do trust falls. Yeah. We don't sing and hold hands and sing Kumbaya. That's not going to win games. I'm very, very intense, even though uh, I come across as 
as, as more of from the lens of laughter. Um, I'm very passionate about things, but yeah, I agree with you. If, if we, if we understand that some of these posters are popular because they are shock and awe, because you're never going to get a poster that says, have a rest day. Right. You're never going to have a poster that says like, get eight hours of sleep. Did you drink your water? But you know, at the end of the day, some of those things are really important. And the one that I'll personalize, so I don't sound judgmental is, you know, I was, I'm, I'm still flawed, but I'm a much better man now than I was in my twenties. I'm married. I have two children and I'm in a much better place because I've grown. But in my twenties, if I would have consumed the poster, never give up yeah. without going into too much detail, brother, I wouldn't be on this podcast right now. Yeah. If I, if I consumed the term never give up when I was an actor in Hollywood, yeah. without any mentorship, without anyone on my shoulder saying, hey, let me explain what this means. I would have just kept being a party animal and I would have been a fool and, and, and who knows what would have happened. That's why it's personal to me. Yeah. Well, so, so it, it brings to mind this idea of responsibility, right? And, mm-hmm. I, and I think, you know, as we, so there's this, this, when I say responsibility, two things come to mind for me and I'd love to, to hear what you, what comes to mind for you too. So as a coach, a lot of times, I think we take on the responsibility very easily of saying, I need to win games, right? I need to develop performance. I need, I have the responsibility to how my team performs, not necessarily the responsibility to how I develop these human beings that are in front of me as people, right? Making sure that I can help lead them in whatever way I need to. Not everybody needs the same thing. So there's responsibility there. And then on the other side of it, and and I'm trying not to stack too much on this, but it's kind of a connected thought. There's the responsibility for athletes that we have in knowing people are watching us, right? And, and in how we share and hold that space and responsibility to our, to our teammates, to our friends, to our family, and truly represent the, I guess, brightest energy that we possibly can within reason, if that makes sense. It does. And with, I'll take the second part first, yeah. this idea of the responsibility for the athlete. I think, yeah. <laughs> I also think it's a little easier. None of them are easy. I think it's a little yeah. bit more uh, fluid to, sh- to teach this lane, which is you can use the advent of social media and the opportunity that these college and pro athletes are instant celebrities. And you can use that to our advantage when we talk about responsibility. So that's what we try to do. We're not social media gurus by any means. There's, there's firms out there that just focus on social media and and the, the, that the narrative and, and that they're fantastic, but we touch on it. Yeah. But if, if a college or pro athlete is, is sharing with me their, their social media platform and what a voice they have, I can use that to our advantage and say, so look, let's look at this responsibility you have. You have, you have 150,000 followers. These are high college players, yeah. the pros, you know, you're in the millions and how can we use this to, to get your cause out? You know, and, and it's changing even in the last few years, Josh, like even with like players tribune and, and mm-hmm. some other publications, the, the, the Atlantic, who are starting to give voice and starting to address real issues, we can use that. The, so that's my, my good to do is, is I, I take that desire to be known and I say, good, be a good steward. Yeah. Of, and we, we will talk about what's the dangers of saying something controversial. Mm-hmm. The dangers are you can look like a fool. The benefit is you'll get more followers. Yeah. And you've got to show them there's ways you can also get more followers by just being a, a really solid strong, productive voice in, in, in your community and talk about things other than sport. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the shut up and dribble makes, makes, makes me, that's offense, offensive on so many levels. The issue with, with responsibility with the, like the coaches that, that, that we may not be able to address that one in 45 minutes. That's tricky. Yeah. I, 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 and that's why when we work with uh, universities, we, we try to try to start at the top and, and, it's really hard to tell an athletic director, hey, let's not focus on wins and losses. When, and then telling a head coach, let's not focus on wins and losses when the head coach's job responsibility is determined upon their wins and losses. So that one's a trickier one to, to, to address. It, it really challenges our ability to, to recognize what we have control of and what we don't have control of, right? Yeah. And, you know. Well, and here's where I, lo- I get excited. It's a, it's yeah. a huge burden. To, you have to connect the dots with um, wellness, and, 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 and clarity of mind and connect that to performance on the field or on the court. Uh, and I also think this is it. You, you can't go in, like I can't go in as a, as a leader of game on and say, I have all the answers. I think that's a huge one is you have to go in with respect and you have to honor the strength coaches and the, and the, and the coordinators and everyone that's a part of the system because you're coming into their world. I, I'm talking from my lens. I'm a consultant. And you have to honor, you have to earn the right to be in that room. And you have to know what the culture is like and 
you're a piece, a very small piece of a system. But if you can connect the dots and show a college football coach that your team um, loving one another and your team getting rest and your team not getting caught in unnecessary drama and your team making good choices and your team getting eight hours of sleep, if you can connect that to wins and losses, then you've actually gained the game. Make sense? You've now gained the game, but boy, it's tough because a coach is sitting there with four hours of sleep saying, man, Steve, if we don't go 10 and two, I'm out. And I'm like, ooh, let's play red light, green light. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Why don't we roll into an improv game? Yeah. Hey, 10 and two, coach? Ten, you, you, you have to go, what if we get three losses? I'm out. Yeah. My entire world is shifted and I have to move and, sit and, and, and get my kids out of school and I have to move homes and I'm thinking, Huh. And that's where you humble yourself and go, there's a big system at play that is a little larger than us. So where do you start there? And I think, you know, and that's a giant question, but it, it's just, you're right, right? There's, there's a system with, with different forces that are at play that truly yeah. make it almost uh, impossible is not the right word, but you've got so many layers that you have to pull off of a coach, right? So uh, like uh, any coaching staff at that level is under this constant level of anxiety and stress that most tech startups aren't under, right? I mean, the level, like right. they're, they're, you know, they're, they're pushed to the max. No, and we know just from, from studies, from research, we are going to respond in terms of interrelationally, like we are going to respond worse when we're put to that max level, right? If I'm running on three hours of sleep and I'm stressed and I'm like, I'm not necessarily going to have the ability to pause and think, wow, what is, what is this? person, this player, this human being asking me in this moment, rather than just saying, why are we doing it? Right? Yeah. I think you need to do your research before you jump into a team culture. And I think you need to wade, wade into it. Yeah. You know, I, I just, I learned the hard way, man. Listen, I'm flawed. I used to roll into these, these college or pro teams. I wouldn't even like check to see what their sponsor was. I'd roll in with my Nikes and they're sponsored by Under Armour. Like just small little things like, right. Like don't wear, UCLA colors when you work for USC, like just be smart, just go online and just do, but coaches and, and, and I'm talking, I know not all your listeners and viewers are, are in my lane as a consultant, but in general, we need to stop and wade in. Don't just jump in. And that takes humility. That doesn't mean I don't, I'm not confident. I'm very confident with what I do. I really am. But I also know, like, know the sponsors, know who the strength coach is, know who the, how long the coach has been there, know the culture. By the way, do they have a leadership coach already in play? Dude, call them up, call her up and be like, hey, I want to honor your pillars. Do you have an acronym you guys use? Oh, you guys use the word like drive. Great. Can, can I honor that? And instead of driving my tiebacks home, I'll use your D-R-I-V-E and I will give you credit. You know what else helps? I don't have PowerPoint that have my like website on it. And you know what sucks is I don't get as many marketing momentum from it, but it, that's my style is, and my team gets mad at me. And there is a fine line between, you know, presenting and letting the world know where you, when you're presenting. But I, the answer, long winded answer to your, to your question is you've got to wade into it with humility um, and understand the, the culture you're dealing with and see if you can complement that culture. And by doing that, then you can start to connect things like love, sleep, clarity, um, laugh with, I've got your back. You can connect that to wins and losses and hope, hopefully every, every, everyone stays gainfully employed. Where, where did that shift come for you? So, so you've kind of, you've alluded to it a couple of times that that wasn't necessarily your, your original kind of default mode walking into these programs, walking into these environments. Was there a, was there a moment that kind of catalyzed that shift for you and saying, man, I need to, I need to have a little wider perspective. I need to move a little bit more okay. uh, with a little more humility and a little bit more gradually into these moments. What, what happened there that really changed your perspective? That's a good question. I wish there was that moment where like I left, <laughs> I left Florida state and right. J- Jimbo, Jimbo said, Steve, you're a mess. Um, no, it was a gradual uh, process. I think one of the things that helped me was I was an actor and as an actor, I had to learn how to get feedback. That's one thing. If you're not getting feedback, then you have no way to improve because no one's going to then tell who's going to tell you. So you, you're, you're kind of, as an actor, you're kind of beat up uh, psychologically a lot. But one of the things you learn is how to get feedback. So while I started Game On and, and started consulting and had other teachers teaching Game On, one of the things we focus on all the time is we must be strong enough to receive feedback. Mm. We must ask for feedback. And, and so I, it was feedback. I've been doing this 20 years. And I would, after every session, I would try to talk to coaches or the team or the players, whoever, 
whether it was a corporate gig, a military gig, or a sports gig. So it's been a slow play, Josh, on how I've learned this. And yeah, it's someone saying, hey, dude, you, were, you, you came in hot. Explain to me what, and it hurts. You don't want to hear that. You want to hear, that was great. You're hilarious, man. You're great. You're great. We all want to hear that. You know what's hard to hear? Hey, dude, you talked too much during that session, or you misread that moment, or you, you didn't honor the fact that our, our motto is win the now, and instead you decided to make fun of that. And it's like, yeah, you learn. So there wasn't one burn moment. It was just, we constantly ask for feedback. My theory is this, as a presenter, as coaches, if we don't ask for feedback, then when you're going to get this feedback is two times. Trust me. It's when you're being broken up with and when you're being fired. Mm. That's when you'll get the feedback. Because then there's no, nothing at stake. It's like, if you're firing me, Josh, I'll be like, dude, so w- w- what did I do wrong? And you're like, well, where do I begin? Because it's over. So that's, I think, a challenge for all of us is to be vulnerable enough to actually get feedback more than more than just don't let your spouse or your significant other be your feedback person. That they're your spouse, they're your significant other. That's it. Uh, so you, I, I want to say th- there's this one video that you reference how many times you were told no as an actor auditioning, right? Like almost yeah. 700 times, I want to say, absolutely. Which, which just in a year, right? In which, one year, in one year, in one year. year, which blows my mind. I was like, oh my gosh. Uh, so. So talk a little bit about the the word no, right? Yeah. And what you really are focused and energized around shifting what that means when somebody hears it and how we use it. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So I actually did a presentation recently. I was like, I, I got I got rejected 700 times in one year. And then I followed that by saying, do you know how many that is? And I, I couldn't believe I just said that. I, I <laughs> said it 700. <laughs> right. So I removed that second part. Do you know how many that is? <laughs> The audience was like, is he kidding? Is that a rhetorical <laughs> question? <laughs> awkward silence. Uh, awkward silence. So yeah, it was close to 700. And so I, I, and I think it's progressed. I think a lot of it has to do with being a former actor. A lot of it has to do with being a, a, a feedback junkie. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with being a father. So now that I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old, I learn that I'm saying no all the time. And it's purposeful. Like I have to say no when my child is running across the street. Before she does, I need to get her back. So I just started to really explore this idea that no is going to be in existence. So how can we reframe? So really the the focus on this is tone. Tone is key. So the tie back to a lot of the games we play that focus on no is tone is key. There is ways to say no. For us to say, always agree with every idea is crazy. Like that's dangerous, man. Like yes and all the time. No, no. But the idea is how can we create some exercises that, that actually show that you can say no in a way that gets you to a better idea. And that's why red light, green light is one of our, our more popular games. And we haven't had to tweak it in 20 years is because it, it elicits laughter. But that's the idea is how can we understand no is going to happen. And also what no does is it, it reframes the, the, the idea that no can actually be a better opportunity. There's also something deeper. I don't teach this a lot. No also starts to lane us into like talking about respecting hierarchy. Yeah. I think it's very important that when we teach in the sports world that, that the idea of we're all equal is, is, not, is not safe because the athletic director is not equal to you if you're a college athlete. Right. That doesn't mean we don't treat each other with respect, but like the head coach isn't equal to the player yeah. and the 18-year-old isn't always equal to the 22-year-old. Yeah. And that doesn't mean we disrespect. It means that no can also be a way to frame when you're being told what to do by an authority figure – and it's in a respectful way that you have to receive no, because you know what? That's the chain of command. There, there's a total recontextualizing that happens right mm. there, right? You know, I mean, it, it just what a word that I think for a lot of people growing up can be associated, especially if it's if there isn't an investment in language and an investment in, and, and I don't mean like a literal monetary investment. I just mean if you if you don't grow up in an environment where you really start to learn the nuances of, of language, right? The word no can be very polarizing, right? And can can explicitly trigger a reaction to us that we don't yeah. necessarily understand. So you're so not only are we shifting the meaning of it, but we're empowering somebody in that moment, as easy or harder as it may be, to recognize that I'm trying to see more in you than yeah. what you just gave me, right? Dude, you just nailed it. If I was in a session right now with you, I would have I'd hand you the mic. I'm not kidding. No, that's a great, what you just said was, I'm going to steal that. I'll give you credit the first couple, <laughs> first couple times. And then I'll forget. I'll forget. I'll be like, my friend Josh said to me once. And then eventually I'll be like, let me tell you. Let me tell you what I said. The art of forgetfulness. Um, <clears throat> this, this concept that, um, 
you can say no in a way that is very loving and encouraging without being fake and cheesy. Right. You can also say no in the heat of the moment. When you're a leader, you can say no in the heat of the moment that is pretty demoralizing, mm -hmm. but you don't know because you're just on the flow. Example would be <clears throat> if you're a head coach, we keep using this example in the sports world, and you've got like a, a let's say a pro team, you've got a rookie, you're the head coach, you're busy, man. You're on four or five hours of sleep. You're in the middle of training camp and you turn to that rookie and you just hammer that rookie with that no uh, when it wasn't necessary. <clears throat> then it can be demoralizing and then you end up having that rookie not as comfortable to raise their hand again to give an idea. And then listen, there's also times when you do have to drive that no home. Sure. Like when your kid's are running across the street or you need to make a point. But yeah, the, the, the tie back to, to a lot of our, especially red light, green light, is tone is key. Tone is key when you deliver no. And, and you know, going back to something we've talked about before, uh, before this interview, translation, right? And finding a way to really, uh, to, to invest the time, probably as the coach or presenter, invest the time in making sure we educate the people around us. This is what this is going to mean from here on out. Yes. Right? And, and that partly is, a, I keep we're talking like presenters, but that's fine because that's my world yeah. is, yeah. that means you don't teach every single day and go on the road and be a circus act. I mean that. It's hard. I, let me let me back up. I can't. I can only speak for me. I don't want to. I sometimes need to remove myself from the stage for a variety of reasons. One is I need to reflect, and I need time to know what organization I'm going into, or else I'm just going to start rinsing and repeating. And then you're going to start forgetting that you put that logo in the wrong spot. And next thing you know, you're going to Florida State and you forgot to remove the Alabama logo. Like, dude, you got to be kidding me. But it's also just allowing yourself time to breathe, just like an athlete, and resetting and saying all right, what's this culture like? It takes time. I do, I do more. My presentations are usually 90 minutes, but we spend two weeks finding out the room setup and the lighting and the chairs, not because I want to look great. Look, I, I never called my agent and was like, oh, Brad Pitt got my part. Like, you know, like, I'm not in this business to be the hero. You know, I'm not, I've never played the hero in acting. I was always the, the, the character guy coming in. I was okay with that. But you, you, a lot of the work we're doing is like room setup and knowing who the, the head coach is and the culture and, and the dynamics and play and what's the air conditioning gonna be like. And, and we fight for uh, excellence. Mm. So we want a room that is gonna be conducive for learning. Just like they care about the field with such excellence, don't, I don't wanna do a session in a weird lit room with bad air conditioning and sounds going over. That's not fair to the participants. So two things come to mind right there, Steve, like one, there is, so there's this notion of, of competition, right? And, and I think going back to what we were talking about with rise and grind with some of the, the, the phrases, the mantras that get really popularized are, are popularized right now. It, there's an association that to compete at the highest level, there can be no space for details in that sense, right? There could, there's only time to be competing, competing, competing. And what I hear in what you're saying is, is not only number one, can you compete from a different perspective, still with the same desire to achieve that level of success, but also there's so much wisdom and opportunity to create space to make sure that you can put the time and energy in where you need to. Yeah, it's like I, I just wrote down, you could work on your business or you can work in your business. Same thing with sport. You can work on your team, work in your team. And listen, it's hard. I, I, listen, I'm not going to sit here and be like, I have all the answers. I hope that's been pretty clear in this conversation. Like, our, if you look at the messaging throughout the world, man, there's just, I, I care so deeply for these coaches at every level, little league, juco, college, pro, like they're, the messages, and there's some amazing ones out there, by the way. Let's be clear. Like, I hope there's listeners going, man, I'm not the rise and grind guy. I celebrate you. I celebrate you. And I know you are because I know some of you. Um, but the messaging that's out there, just really let's be aware. We are vulnerable to deception. When the messaging out there is attack the day, win the now, uh, win at all costs, rise and grind. I mean, I'm not mocking this message. I'm telling you it's all we're hearing, though. So, and then you've got the competition component. You've got the keep up with the Joneses component. And here's what ends up happening. We end up on a pattern of getting four hours of sleep a night. We're drinking diet Cokes. Believe me, I'm aware that I'm sipping coffee during this podcast, but like my last sip, I'm like, Oh, that's, I wish we could edit that out. We can edit that out. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's my only cup I have a day and I stretch it out. But the point being is a lot of the messages that are being sent are not what you're talking about, which is take a break, rest, um, reflect, take a walk. 
you know? So let's bring that into to game dynamics, right? Into yeah. what you've done with the mile curriculum. Like I mm-hmm. think both, both, you know, sharing for our listeners what that is and then okay. to why you guys started there and the thought process behind it. Cool. Well, I, we didn't really start with mile. We started with this curriculum and then I, I sort of, um, sort of re you know, re engineered it to understand what we were doing. Well, about 10 years ago, I had to explore why this curriculum is being received because I knew it wasn't just me. Mm-hmm. And people said, well, this can't be taught outside of you. And then we were able to get 12 other consultants to teach around the country. So that, okay, we, it's certainly not just about me. Um, so we explored it and we realized there's game dynamics in these exercises. And then we explored like which game dynamics. So I started studying video games um, and it got me to think that there's about 52 video game dynamics in the, all the popular video games, things like time and sound and emotion and mystery and incentive and laughter. And, and, and I was taught this by video game designers. So we bartered with video game designers to do training with them. And then they gave us their insight. So from there, I started to go, well, well, first of all, I needed to come up with a good acronym, but I also didn't want to force it. So I, at first I had, um, I had mystery and I had incentive, um, but I didn't have the L. I had joy, hmm. but, but my j- is a really weird word. Not a sketchy. So, yeah, so I switched. <laughs> so anyway, point being, it's mild. Mystery, incentive, laughter, and empowerment. So we saw that in every video game designer, we saw those four dynamics were in play, and we found that all of our exercises we teach had an element of mile mm. in them. They had an element of mystery. What's going to happen? Incentive. There's a, some kind of reward that we're trying to achieve. It may not be tangible. There was always laughter and there was always empowerment, meaning there was no exercise we play that's going to shame someone. So basically we took all of our exercises and put it through the mile machine. Yeah. And if it didn't score a four, we didn't play it. Mm. So that's sort of where we used mile from an internal perspective was, and, and this is helpful for anyone who's doing interactivity. If you have an exercise and you're like, Hmm, I wonder if this is going to be effective. Let me tell you when you shouldn't try it out. Mm. You shouldn't test it with a bunch of players the first time. And I say that very clearly because this is something I don't take lightly. The time for you to test your exercise is not during your session. Mm. That's not fair, man. Oh, that didn't work. It ended up being a sexual innuendo. Well, that's great. You had to learn that through teaching a bunch of 18 year olds. Like, so you mile it. And if you mile an exercise, you'll see if it scores a four, if it scores a four, it's going to be pretty safe to play. But if you have two people salsa dancing and holding each other's hips in a team dynamic exercise, that, that's probably not going to be cool. So there, you just got a zero on the empowerment side. Make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, so two questions quick. Yeah. One, what prompted you to say, okay, this isn't just me. I need to zoom out a little bit and understand why this is working. Because I think, so I'll just take that on a super, super micro level as athletes, right? When we compete, there is this uh, unusually strong sense. And I think some of the, the, the popular cultural terms that we're talking about right now are, are some of the reason for it. But there's a sense of believing we are the reason it happened, right? This is, this is only mm-hmm. happening because of what I'm doing. So <laughs> where I, I just find that super fascinating that you had the intuition to say, whoa, maybe there's something more here. Oh. Uh. I think because I really want to be known and then I don't want to be known. <laughs> I think I, I want to be known. What do you known. mean by that? I, I, I think there was a part of me that's like, I want to be the, the lighthouse. I want to be the guy that runs game on. And then immediately when I got a taste of that, it freaked me out entirely. I'm like, wait a second. And what really ended up happening was I realized none of us are lighthouses. That if there's a speaker out there who thinks they're a lighthouse and you're charming and dynamic, you'll probably speak for the rest of your life. I don't think one speaker is a lighthouse. I don't. And I think that we're fooling ourselves if there's one person with all the answers that, that's living currently on this planet. Um, so that was part of it. It was like, I'm not the lighthouse. Second of all, I didn't want to be traveling all the time. I didn't want to be that guy who's like the, the leadership coach. I mean, I told you this before we got on, on, on this podcast. I'll share it quickly, sake of time. You know, I, I have a six-year-old that won't stay in timeout. I yelled at her to get in timeout one morning recently. She said no. You know, I said, get in time out. She said, no, you know, and then I yelled at my wife, Jackie, and my daughter's like, who are you talking to? You know, it's just it's crazy. And by the way, I would never post this on Facebook or yeah. Twitter. So you'll <laughs> never know about it until I tell it to you. And, and, and my daughter, they looked at me, she goes, where are you going? You know, it was early morning and I, I screamed to teach leadership and I slammed the door and I left and I walked away going, oh my gosh, no, none of us are lighthouses. It's all challenging. We're all flawed. So part of it was realizing that part of it was, I didn't want to be that leadership communication guy 
who's out of shape uh, uh, um, and, and running around the country 260 days a year to be a guru. And, and I'm not mocking that. It just, it's not what I wanted. Yeah. So I wanted clarity. How do I get clarity? I need to have other people sharing this message and not being on the road all the time. Yeah. So that's wow. kind of where I got to this, like, let's, let's teach this to other people because I believe the curriculum is better than me. Yeah. Uh, I'm very confident in what I do, but I think the curriculum is better than I am. And then we've proven that there's some teachers out there, Josh, that are like teaching better than me. Like I got people, coaches saying, you know, I wanted to go from who's Steve to where is Steve, right. you know, like, and then, right. you know, so it goes actually first people will say, well, where's Steve? We need Steve. And it got to where we were like, who's Steve? Like, I don't even, I love that to the point where actually we'd rather have Leonard than Steve. <laughs> yeah. That was great. I'm like, Leonard, you got the gig. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go hang out with my love kids. It. There's one other quick thing on the mile that I wanted to hit on quickly. I yeah. know there's be sensitive to time, but after studying mile and, and the dynamics on how it could be used as a, as a, a vehicle to put our games through. So we're not j- jacking people up. Right. I don't want to mess up Jason kids back. Right. I don't want to mess up the 14 year old kid who wants to be Jason kid. Why would I want to play around with that level of, 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 of responsibility? The other thing about mile that's powerful is I realized where mile really started. And this is what we teach a lot is, it starts with the most played game in the history of civilization, which is hide and seek. Yeah. So that's kind of where we, and it's not in a cheesy, goofy way. We don't have people play hide, but I try to explain to every audience, I don't care how tough they are. We do this with military. We do this with four-star generals. How many of you played hide and seek as a kid? Every one of them raised their hand. Everyone. I've never had someone not raise their hand. There was a guy on the Sacramento Kings years ago, and he didn't raise his hand. I, oh, there goes my streak. And then he whispered to his friend, well, this young man was from Kenya. And then he said, ah, we call it hide in bush. We call it hide in bush. <laughs> that's, that's great. And he raised his hand. And I was like, cool. So then I thought, okay, that's a common denominator, man. Everyone played hide and seek. Why? Well, it has, it's the purest form of mile. Mystery, where's Josh hiding? Incentive, I want to find you. Laughter, I tag you. We both just laugh. Empowerment, man. We're playing our game, man. Ready or not, here I come. So once we realized that Mile was actually started with hide and seek and everyone in the world played hide and seek, that gave us a common denominator. So we can enter any one of these places and going back to your first question about trust, that's our way to develop trust within the first seven minutes to say, you know what? I'd like to focus on what we have in common, not what separates us. So... What what comes into my mind? This this is incredible, Steve. And what uh, what I'm thinking about is the notion of, I, on the surface, sport would appear to have so much of those game dynamics built into it, right? Like there's just sport. Like, sport is the best game. I love that. Yeah. Sport is the keep Go. going. Sport is the best game dynamic live, and that's why it's a billion dollar industry. Yeah, yeah, and 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 yet, what's so fascinating to me is that the one piece of it that maybe isn't consciously uh, what's the word cultivated and there there's pieces of it in, in a couple different places but laughter right what you guys do with laughter i find so empowering you know no pun intended because it truly is i remember being in locker rooms where it, even in moments where i know we would have performed better with a sense of just not not ignoring the, the reality of the situation just an energy and enthusiasm that comes with laughter it wasn't there and it wasn't consciously cultivated that in those moments we could truly be better because we unleash that side of ourselves. So I, I think that's a really interesting dynamic. And I think the one that's the hardest of the four in a culture in locker room is laughter because mystery is fairly understood. You know, what's next? I don't know. You, you can't, you can trick out mystery a little bit. Incentive has to have some definition, but laughter's actually been mystified. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, been, yeah. it's been poorly defined. So the reason laughter doesn't work as well in cultures is because first of all, you have to establish laugh with, not at. People get fearful that laughter is going to become like the gay joke, the sex joke, the drug joke, the culture joke. And what, where is that coming from? Well, no offense, but look at the world. Look at the media. Look at the internet. Like, look at the YouTube stars. Like, so much of the laughter is about I gotcha. So much of the laughter is shame laughter. So much of the laughter is I'm going to get a joke at someone else's expense. Well, you just add that up, and I'm trying to make the Pittsburgh Pirates right now in spring training. Bro, that's the last thing I'm going to do is try to be funny. Yeah. That, that's out. I'm just trying to survive. And the fact of the matter is I don't want to be the butt of your joke. I don't want to get a towel whipped at me. I don't want to get my nose made fun of. I'm just not into that. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm just sitting in my corner and I'm just going to try to play lights out. So the laughter component, the problem is the word laughter fits our acronym really well because it's an L. But I, when I get into session, I explain, listen, MILE is a, is a great acronym. It just works. But really, let's define laughter. Laughter is about celebrating one another. Mm. Laughter is about joy. 
Laughter is about a breathing and smiling. Laughter is about um, being self-deprecating. Laughter is about um, um, not taking everything like it's life and death. But I agree with you, man. But you're seeing it, Josh. Like, here, I'll give you a couple of examples. You'll start to see, like, in the NFL, which is a pretty intense, vicious sport, you start to see those, uh, that some of those teams start to go into their, like, end zone celebrations. And I know some of them veer into the laugh at, but, but there's a reason why those are catching fire, is they're trying to find a moment to, to alleviate the stress. And then next thing you know, you got the guys doing like, I don't know, they did like the beanbag jump and they, you know, they're doing this thing and, and the NFL will have to curtail it. But that's the, that to me is the desire for these guys to just find a moment for joy before they reset and try to um, take someone's head, take someone's head off. Yeah. There, there's this, um, yeah, it's just real, right? Like, like they're the, the what comes to my brain is, is the, so in those kind of moments, right, of course we need to find something that gives us that, that level of, of outlet that isn't going to um, drain our energy, right? So we, we've had a couple different athletes on uh, post-career that have really focused on how do we transition professional athletes out of their sport into, into society, into not just society, that, but, but into the world as somebody who can truly experience the same level of joy and energy that they had playing. And one of the greatest challenges is there's no, there's no feeling or fulfillment that they can find relative to what they experience playing. And, and there's just this thought that comes to mind of like, if we can cultivate more of that love and that laughter within the sport while they're playing, it doesn't leave as gaping a hole when they walk away because they can find other ways to connect with the world around them. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. And you start to tap into athletes creativity. I mean, let's just use basketball. Yeah. Basketball is one of the most pure forms of mile. It's also one of the most creative sports there is. You know, and so when you transition these athletes, the tra athlete transitions out, they need to understand some of the giftings they had to be such a fantastic basketball player can actually play beautifully in the real world. It's really just, again, going back to just redefining, you know, what that means. But yeah, they're way better suited to transition than they think. Um, it's just about having the, the support system to, to, to encourage them. Like, man, the, what you did, Jason Kidd, what you did as an athlete, as a point guard, my goodness, you could you could see things other people can't see. Let me show you how you can use that as a leader. Let me show you how you can use that as an entrepreneur. And we just have to remember these pro athletes stop their career development in the real world at around 18 and, and they're now retiring at 34. So you have to give them some grace <clears throat> that they've been in a unique environment with uh, focusing on a very specific skill. That's all. Yeah. It, it expands, it's this notion of expanding capacity, right? And really just really trying to pull back and see a, a, a wider perspective. I, uh, as we round out the, the interview, before I ask my last question, yeah. where can these guys go to find you online? So our, thanks, Josh. Our website, because if you didn't ask, I wouldn't give it. Uh, our website <laughs> is, our website is, do I have to say www anymore? Or no, no. We just, no. We just, we're, we're <laughs> that. Uh, gameonnation.com, gameonnation.com is our, our website. So for my last question, yes. uh, this show is called On the Athlete, and that yep. came from the place of saying, we want to understand what it takes to be a mind, body, and spirit competitor. So when I say, what does an On the Athlete mean to you? Mm. The word complete comes to mind. And a lot of this is because I've spoken to you for, for an hour now, Josh. We had a chance to talk prior. So I, have, so I feel like I have some of the answers to the test prior to the actual question. But I wasn't prepared for this question but still taking all of our interaction in, in play and what I know about what you are all doing. Um, I, I, I think of words like whole and complete. Um, I almost think it's in some ways compliments the athlete. It's <clears throat> a, a human being who also happens to have a gift to be an athlete. And I think that if we can all understand that more, I think you guys are doing something really cool in um, the, the athlete is not just, an athlete. I think that's really sort of in some ways patronizing. Um, just like an actor is not just an actor. They're a father and a mother and a human being and an activist and a voice, a very powerful voice. So I'd say uh, Omni Athlete to me is a complete person with tremendous power to make a difference in the world. And I want to uh, encourage those folks at that platform. I'm not a professional athlete. You're not a professional athlete. You were an elite athlete. I was a good high school athlete. That's about as far as I went. But I think it's cool that, that the Omni community and the Game On community at least has a voice in the room to help these folks that are at the top of the mountain, encourage them to share their voice and to, and to do their best to improve the world.
Wow. Thank you, Steve. Um, this, this has been amazing. Truly. I, uh, guys, I cannot recommend highly enough how much I, you guys need to go, go on gameonnation.com right now. Check out the videos they have on there. The, the thing that comes screaming off the page as you watch this is just how much fun Steve and his team has when they are, are presenting these concepts that truly allow us to access a side of sport that we just don't really consciously experience enough, right? We know it's there. We, we, we do it. We just sometimes need a little help to remind ourselves of why we do it. And, and Steve and his team, Oh my gosh, watch the videos, reach out to them and just recognize like you can have fun and still compete at a level that, that truly sets you up to succeed. And he and his team are living proof of that. So I can't recommend it highly enough guys. Uh, this was an awesome episode and uh, until next time. What is up Omni athletes. Thank you guys for watching another episode of Omni athletes. If this content is adding value to your lives, guys, please like and share and subscribe in every way you can. Share our content that helps us grow this community, which is really ultimately what we are after right now. So please like, comment, share, tell your friends about what we're doing. If it's adding value, please share it. And if it's not, tell us so we can really improve this content to make sure it's something that you guys want and want to see. Coming up, guys, in July, I'm super excited to announce we have the 2018 Sports Energy and Consciousness Festival. It's going to be in San Rafael, California. This is an absolutely incredible event for a lot of reasons. The main one being you get to actually engage with so many of the people that we've had on the show, so many of the leaders in sports, energy, and consciousness. The speakers are absolutely incredible, and the community is even more incredible. So I cannot encourage you guys enough get to this festival. It is going to be an experience that transforms your vision of athletics, your ability to achieve peak performance, to find flow, to awaken an expanded level of consciousness in your performance that you just cannot find anywhere else. It's truly the tip of the iceberg and you guys want to be part of it. July 13th through 15th in San Rafael, California. Go to sportsenergyfestival.com to get your tickets today before they run out. It, it's going to go quick, guys. Get there. sportsenergyfestival.com, July 13th through 15th. We'll see you there.